Good afternoon. I'm Connie Slampak. I am the president of the chamber, and I am so happy to be here. And I do want to say good afternoon, but I want to thank Dr. Charles for the, Dr. Patrick for that because I was looking at my watch also. Is it before or afternoon? But I think it's a wonderful thing on behalf of the chamber. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to welcome you. Um, it's not often. I, I think when I was young, I used to look back and think, wow, you know, maybe someday I can meet a senator or a representative or a commissioner. And we get to do that today. And I love that you are all here and interested in what's going on and concerned on what's going on and that we have people that are willing to speak to us today. So I want to thank you all for being here. At this point in time, I'm going to um, introduce our moderator, Greg Parsons. Greg is going to take care of business with us for the afternoon. Um, he's very good at what he does, and please welcome him. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Connie. Can you everybody hear me okay? Again, uh, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, we want to welcome all of you and thank you for taking some time out of your busy days to come here to listen to our, our elected officials and, and the important, uh, to talk about the important issues that, that we all uh, are faced with today. In order to prepare, you know, the survey was distributed to everyone in the county that are members, and we came up with about uh, six or seven questions uh, that we will ask each of them, they, they each have an, will have an opportunity to, to answer them. And, uh, uh, you know, some of the things were, uh, some of the top responses were, you know, working with the school districts to build better education, how, how to attract new businesses, how to grow the workforce, how do we help residents, you know, build um, healthier lives. And, um, you know, these were, these were very uh, good, good uh, responses and we're anxious to hear some of the results. So, um, as county commissioners, you know you are elected officials who oversee our county activities and work to ensure that the citizens' concern, you know, uh, are met with federal and state requirements are fulfilled and county operations are run smoothly. So, again, we're going to ask you some of these questions, and we're going to give you the opportunity. We give you five minutes, and um, um, I'll, I'll try to give you a one-minute warning when you have a minute left. Uh, but we'd like to try to keep it to five minutes so that we can get through all, all of those questions and give everyone the opportunity to, to you know, to answer them. Um, uh, so um, we'll start off with uh, uh, the, the, the chair, chairman of the commissioners there, um, uh, Commissioner Lohr, and I'll ask you the first question. Um, oh, I'm sorry, yes, we do. You know, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to do an introduction. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Pass the mic over to uh, Commissioner Lohr. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Hi, everybody. For uh, Commissioner Dave Lohr here, and I uh, just want to thank Penn State Fayette Campus and the Chamber for uh, the opportunity to be here today, and for all you guys to to be out in the audience listening to us. Uh, the one thing that, that we do like to do is to keep you informed of what's happening in the county and, and uh, just give you our ideas and, and everything that we can possibly do. Uh, I've been the commissioner for seven, and seven years and three months, and uh, it's been great. And it's like anything, it has a love-hate affair. And it doesn't matter what we do, we always have those type of atmospheres around us. Well, it's always been a love-hate affair for everything, including as even the commissioner. But at the same time, there's a lot more love than there is hate. And the exciting thing for me is that, that, we've been able, that I've been able to help a lot of people, which is my goal, and to change things in the county. I remember the uh, one thing that the chamber, uh, the chamber had a question back in 2015 for the candidates that year. And this question was, what would you do to change the morale, the, the atmosphere of the county? And guess who was first up? Me. Now that question, Sitting in front of an audience of people is a very, very hard question because uh, some of the questions that we're being asked this afternoon are going to be some of the things that we've worked on over that time period. But that question was a tough one to answer. And the very first thing that came to my mind, the good Lord above gave me a, 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 just a thought process, that every morning at that point, I was walking into Martin's food store in Connellsville and buying a donut. 
and I'd already stopped at McDonald's to have my iced tea, sweet naturally. Um, and um, as I was walking, as I walked into Martin's every morning, I would always smile at people. And I would continually smile at people. And there were people that didn't respond quickly at the first time, but over time, they finally started smiling back. Guess what my answer was to that question? Smile at people. So for me, for what I've done really hard or tried to do my absolute best over the last seven years is to try to get people to understand that we live in the greatest place that, that this state offers, and that's Fayette County. And for me, I smile at people and tell them how great we are and how great you are, because that's exactly what we are. In Fayette County, we have the best. We have the best places to come to. We have the best of everything. And that's so exciting for me because I get to help lead, and when I say lead, serve. I don't look at this as a, as a position up in the top, I look at it as with everybody else. As a, I work with you, I work with everyone out here to try my absolute best to make your lives better. And that's my goal all the time, is to do that, and I know we, all three of us are working hard to make that happen for everybody. And uh, as a team player, we're all team players, and as a team player, that's what we try to do with the three of us on a consistent basis. And by the way, our staffs are the bigger part. And uh, anyone who's elected position actually knows how important that staff is. Chamber and all. Chamber and all. They're just so vital to us. So uh, that's pretty much it. Okay. Commissioner Vasid? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to, and honor to be here today. And have the opportunity to speak and, and uh, relay my, our thoughts and our feelings about the county. And we've worked very close with the Chamber of Commerce for many years. Uh, they're, they're really uh, uh, important in our uh, administration of our county government and the things that they help us with. And so we have that good rapport, and we're going to continuously keep that rapport in the future. But, uh, you know, it, as a commissioner for many years, I've always focused on long-term growth and development of the county. That to me was going to get us to a point where we could compete economically with other counties around us and other states. And I think we've, we've reached that point. Uh, we have a good uh, public-private partnership with our chambers and our uh, FAPEN Economic Development Council, and it's really helped us. Um, uh, move, turn the corner and, and do the things we need to do to be in a position to grow economically. And my track record has always been economic growth, uh, job retention and, and job growth, infrastructure development, business parks uh, development and expansions, tourism promotion and public transportation enhancement. I focused on those areas and those are my priorities as far as growing the county and making it a better place to live, work, and play, and, and, and raise a family. I think we have all the amenities in Fayette County. People come here all the time to visit. We just got to get them to stay here and, and live here, work here, and, and, and enjoy our beautiful countryside. Um, the things I'm working on priority-wise, uh, I think all the commissioners are doing that, but our priorities are the airport runway expansion, the uh, business park at Mount Macrina, we're expanding that. We've had great success on the other side of Route 40 with the Fayette County Business Park, and we are bought some land over at uh, Mount Macrina, and we're going to ex be expanding there. Um, Route 21, it's the most dangerous highway in Pennsylvania, and we want to try to get that to four lanes. And it's an economic development corridor. It's, all, it's got water and sewer along there now. It can be really have a real positive impact. Uh, we have to get broadband countywide. It's, it's very, very important. Uh, the, we have a lot of underserved areas and areas that have no service at all. We have a, a countywide plan coming out this, uh, this spring, and we're going to be ready to be aggressive in getting grant funds. And... Uh, also, the Sheepskin Trail. We're making progress. We're multitasking and expediting it. Um, and infrastructure development that ties into all the long-term growth and development. Trying to get water down in the Gans area. We're doing water projects in the mountain, water pro uh, sewer projects in North Union. 
that's going to enhance Fayette County's economic growth. Um, we, we started that infrastructure bank in Fayette County that uh, is very important to, uh, you know, funding these infrastructure projects. Um, and one thing I think that will tie all this in, and I know I've worked with the senator on this over the years, is getting the Mon Fayette Expressway built into Monroeville so it can get into Pittsburgh. That will tie us into the epicenter of our region. I think I can be of big help with all those types of things. Being, I, I sought the Secretary Treasurer of the SPC, and uh, I will be Vice Chairman at the end of the year if I'm successful in my election. And um, that that position, I, I'm in the leadership of the SPC, and about six billion dollars of funds are going to be coming through SPC in the next five years. So hopefully, we can get doing the quick math, a uh, half a billion maybe. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, we want to get as much money into Fayette County for infrastructure projects as we possibly can. Roads, water, sewer, broadband. And, and if we can do that, we can position Fayette County for a long-term growth and development uh, and, and help. You know, I, have, I have kids that are here and, and, and a granddaughter, and they're staying here. So I want this county to be the best it can be for the future. Thank you. Well, they always make me go last, and they've already said everything I want to say. So that doesn't mean I'm not going to talk, though. Um, we are the chief administrators of Fayette County government. We are in charge of hiring, firing, budget, spending, uh, union contracts, other contracts, employee discipline, all that fun stuff. And that's all the stuff that you are not here to hear. You, but that is at least half of our job. The other half of the job is the fun stuff. And that's where we get to build our community back. And that's the stuff that I really have focused on, three basic areas. The first is infrastructure, uh, as has already been mentioned. Uh, we need water projects in our area. We have uh, a big need for sewage. Broadband is, is a huge economic driver and can be uh, very beneficial to helping us grow our economy. Everything is, is Wi-Fi based and broadband based right now. Um, so the, the study that's coming out this spring, hopefully not only does it tell us where we need it, actually we kind of already know where we need it, um, but it's going to give us some funding mechanisms and some things that are kind of out of the normal, hey, let's apply for a grant and do that. Uh, so hopefully uh, we have more, uh, we're ready to go because of this study, uh, we'll, we'll be more prepared for broadband. Um, the other thing is uh, electricity. We have uh, companies in Fayette County ready to expand and they can't because the electric grid will not support the expansion of their business. So uh, we met with the president of the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association and in preparing for their meeting, they said, we want you to, to think about one thing. And I thought, well, that's going to be, you know, tax credits or transportation or this or that. And they came back with microgrids. A microgrid is an on-site electric power generator that these uh, manufacturers want. They don't want to uh, rely on the standard grid as has been in the past. We have the ability in Fayette County to support that with the natural gas that is under our feet. Not only do we have the natural gas uh, of the Marcellus, uh, hundreds of years there, the Utica is thousands of years of natural gas underneath the feet of Fayette County. Um, and what that does, if you can bring it up out of the ground and put it directly into a generator, that eliminates the need for pipelines and eliminates uh, a lot of the, the, the environmental concerns that come along with that. So uh, that's something that we can uh, that explore at this point. Um, and again, working with a lot of the, the manufacturers and you know, we, uh, we want to bring manufacturing back in a big way. We also want to rely heavily on our agriculture. Um, and so that was bucket number one. Bucket number two is tourism. We also have to rely, we, we have to boost our tourism. Not only am I talking about 
our tourism promotion, but I think we have the ability right now to boost uh, the actual destinations that we, we can increase the number of destinations in Fayette County, which will be increase the number of uh, tourists who come here and spend their money and stay here. Uh, and we see that right now in Connellsville. Uh, we've introduced a, a potential project in Connellsville that could cost $25 million grant funded, of course, uh, which would uh, transform an old railroad bridge into one of these destinations. We see right now with the Great Allegheny Passage, um, the economic impact. You can empirically look at the economic impact of the Great Allegheny Passage. The 150 miles of that brings $121 million of economic activity and 1,400 jobs. So now as we build the Sheepskin Trail, which is 34 miles, if you prorate that over the Sheepskin Trail, the Sheepskin Trail economic impact would be $27 million to our local economy, provide 300 jobs, and pay $4.3 million in federal, state, and local taxes. So that is the economic impact of the trail. The trail um, is 34 miles long. I am proud that right now we have, under some sort of progress, that either being title searching, acquisition, actual construction, or final engineering, about 26 miles. So we're, we're, we're working on it, and uh, I, I'm sure we, I, I won't work, and I, I know these guys, won't stop working until it's done. So that's two, two buckets. The third bucket is we have to address poverty in Fayette County. There is a direct correlation between the poverty rate and your educational status. Um, the poverty rate is about 17%. If you have dropped out of high school, your poverty rate is about 35%. If you have some college or trade training, your poverty rate in Fayette County is 3.49%. So there is a direct correlation between poverty and education. And so I believe it's our job to boost education in Fayette County, to boost training. Um, I had a very brief uh, conversation with the Westmoreland Fayette Industrial Development Board, or what, what I'm sorry, I, I, I said that wrong. Uh, the Workforce Investment Board, I'm sorry. Um, just just standing up here and said, we, we, we have to do more educationally. And not only that, then you start talking about what happens in our, our high schools. We have to get our kids motivated and inspired to stop going to a life of crime and to go to show them the possibilities that if you go and get educated here, that you can have a life of success and you can work here in Fayette County where you can live and where you can play. And so I am uh, all on board and I, I know that there's a lot of work to do. And I always say, we didn't get here over, this, this didn't happen last night and we're not gonna solve all of our problems by tomorrow. But uh, if we don't take that first step, it never stops. So, thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Okay, now we're gonna get to the fun stuff here. We're gonna go to the questions. And we'll start with uh, Commissioner Lohr. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, we, we conducted a survey amongst the membership, and these are some questions that appeared to be the most commonly asked. Uh, we'll start with, and each of you will have an opportunity to respond to these questions if you so choose. Uh, so the first question I've selected is, um, are there any plans to expand public transportation in Fayette County? Um, well, our fax system, or, uh, or bus lines and uh, transportation that's here is actually very active. I know that our new director is very aggressive in working with the school systems that when they're able to. I know there's some rules or regulations they have to abide by. Um, he's always looking to, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that, to add routes and to continue to build off that so that there's more access to going different places. I know that uh, they have routes into Morgantown. They do go clear to Pittsburgh. Uh, they work with uh, the veterans when need be and, uh, and just different entities. So they are always working to uh, make it better and to expand it. But one of the things that goes back to the workforce, uh, some of the things that they have a problem with are drivers 
and workforce. And if anyone knows that uh, there's someone out there that would want to be a driver, make sure that you send them our way. But uh, at the same time, it's one of these things that, yes, the transportation system in a rural area is sometimes tough. But fortunately, we have a very strong program that's going on now. I know we replace our buses on a regular basis, and uh, things are, are very good over there. It's, uh, it's been growing. It's a good system. And anyone that needs it, please, um, please call them, and they'll set something up with you. <clears throat> Thank this you. This is a good question. Uh, fact has really grown over the years. Uh, since the, about the mid-'90s till now, it started out with just two vans, small vans, that were, and they worked out of one of the, uh, one of the uh, suites in the commissioner's office. Now it's a, uh, you know, a, one of the best rural transportation systems in, in the state. Uh, they have 28 buses. Uh, they run most of their buses on natural gas now. Um, prior to the pandemic, uh, they were picking up people at 20,000 rides a month uh, with all the programs. And it's down, it's dipped a little since the pandemic. So our goal is to increase ridership again. We just did a new branding process that uh, is the start of, you know, uh, promoting uh, fact uh, to a much higher level and, and get people interested in ridership. And ultimately, I'd like to see... Uh, you know, all the transit authorities in the southwestern part of the state work together where they can have connector uh, buses so you can get from a union town into Washington or Westmoreland or into Allegheny um, where, the, where you can, uh, you know, have designated stops where you, you can go from point A to point B to point C. Um, I think this can be accomplished. We've started those discussions. Uh, uh, we have... Uh, uh, the commissioners of the 10 county regions have talked about that, uh, trying to get that coordinated. It's going to be a monumental effort, to, but I think it can be done with cooperation from our uh, people that we have sitting on the board at SPC, which are the three commissioners and two other at-large members uh, in, in Fayette County, and our planning direct, uh, director, our community development specialist, and our economic development coordinator. Thank you. So the simple answer is yes, we're going to expand FACT. And the way I see it expanding is when we build out um, additional training centers and we build out uh, you know, di different services for the need, and I talked about attacking poverty, I want to remove transportation as a barrier that somebody has for, um, to exit poverty. So if, if it is getting people to training, getting people to a job, um, in all of that. So we, uh, as we plan these things, fact is always in the back of my mind thinking, okay, we may need another run here. And so I, I think that fact can absolutely be part of the uh, equation to help us uh, w with our uh, attack on poverty. Thank you, commissioners, especially for, for uh, being uh, nice uh, and concise on your answers. That gives us more time for more questions. All right, the second question we have is, um, how will you update current development plans and zoning to accommodate and the new direction of development in the technology industry and local production of foods? What plans do you have for infrastructure improving, includes, including roads, water lines, sewage, and broadband? Okay, Commissioner Lohr. I always get the first part of the question. <laughs> uh, Grabbing the last part of that in particular is the water lines and sewage lines, broadband. Uh, that's very high on our list. The one thing in particular are water lines and, and broadband. Those are vital in our lives today. And I know we've worked, we're working on projects right now in uh, relation with several of the authorities to expand their water lines. And when the one thing that happens, and this happened up in the Markleysburg area and also all over the mountain, is when the water authority put open the ground up for water lines, they also laid conduit for broadband. So coordinating the uh, projects together from the different entities that are involved with it is, is a high priority on our, our side so that you're not doing double the work and you expand that so that it, uh, or you put them in at the same time so that you're not paying the money to do it again. And uh, that's that's a high priority on my list. The one thing in particular over the last couple of years, and we did this in 2020, is on the broadband side, 
We used um, uh, COVID monies to actually run broadband and to expand it on hotspots. And some of our hotspots are running 157 mega, mega gigs, something like that. I always get that mixed up, sorry about that. But uh, our hotspots are running hot, and uh, those lines that we put in, I called it the backbone, is that uh, we wanted to be able to have companies come back in on the backside so that they could actually run into the houses, into the businesses, so that they would have broadband. But all this mixed together is, is dealing with cost factors, and the money is very, uh, it's very expensive to do all these things. So we try our absolute best to find the lightest way of expense. We've worked with our engineering firms, several engineering firms, to get this accomplished in the companies. And I think we're on a very good road right now, uh, working with uh, the different entities, the authorities, to get good water. The one thing about it is everyone should have availability to good water and also broadband. Highest priority for us is, are those two areas in particular is to get that out there. And with that, when you build the water, you build the broadband, the, uh, the companies and the people will come to this county. So our population, which I know that's another part of one of the questions, but our population can grow because we have availability to these things, along with um, businesses coming in the same way. So it's very vital that we really sh push hard on, uh, on getting that accomplished. And uh, Nate, I have a discussion with you after, the meeting, or after this today, because there's something that I hope to uh, work with the federal side to make sure they start focusing a little different on how this money is being spent. Because we need to make sure that on the federal side, they don't lighten up the rules, same way with our senators and our legislators, that they don't lighten up the rules on how this money is being spent, uh, or you know, what it comes down to us. So um, I'm very, very picky about that. I'm also very strong on getting broadband and water everywhere. Sewage, on the other hand, I'm sorry, still time? Yeah. Sewage, on the other hand, there's one thing about it, and I know I've had a lot of discussions with the engineers, and some of them are sitting in here, but I've had a lot of discussion with engineers. Sewage is one of these things that, um, I'm, like if, they're, if a company comes in and they have a large enough land site, they can do their sewage. They can actually develop through engineering. They can actually figure out how one to minute. put sewage in. So the sewage isn't quite as high on my list, but I will say this, the water and the broadband truly is. So that's what we're really pushing hard on. Will you repeat the question? <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's a long question. That's why I grabbed the last sure. one. I think it relates, sure. everything relates sure, to Vince. zoning, is that correct? Um, yeah, zoning yeah. How will you update current development plans and zoning to accommodate the new direction of development in, in the in technology industry and local production f of foods? What plans do you have for infrastructure improving Improvement, including roads, water lines, sewage, and broadband. So the question is related to the technology industry and production of foods and, and also our infrastructure. Well, those are the things that I outlined in my opening comments. I mean, we're focused you know, totally on long-term growth and development. Um, you know, where we're going to be in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Um, we do countywide zoning, but we don't have every municipality. I think we're probably at 30 or 31 municipalities we do out of 42. So we can't really affect the zoning of the local government that chooses to do their zoning. But the ones that we have, uh, the 30 or uh, I think it's 31, uh, we, we do have zoning ordinances that you know, constantly need updated. We did our remake of our zoning ordinance probably uh, 15 years ago, and uh, it's, it needs updated again, uh, and we do those by zoning amendments. We also, uh, you know, every 10 years should be updating our comprehensive land use plan for, you know, what those uh, properties, the, the parcels should be, what, what's the highest and best use of those properties in the future, um, so that we're probably coming up on uh, the need to do another uh, uh, you know, like a, a revamped uh, uh, master plan for com you know, comprehensive land use plan. Uh, those things all tie into our decision making on a daily basis. Um, we sit in on zoning hearings, so knowing what projects we're working on, whether it be broadband or water or sewer or any kind of other thing that, that, that that's a priority, we try to remember you know, that and how it relates to uh, our zoning and our, de our zoning decisions. If we broke that question down to every one of those topics, we'd be here, no one else would get a chance. 
<laughs> so one of the the zoning things that I that I see coming up, and it's not related to uh, technology or food, but it is related to tourism. And one of the things I'd like to see is to have a tourism, like a, a zoning overlay of our tourist areas and our, our trails uh, so that we can exclude undesirable type businesses. We don't want uh, our tourists coming to uh, our beautiful Fayette County and then being exposed to something uh, that they shouldn't be exposed to. So that's one of the zoning things that I would propose and I think some of the cities uh, would need to do that on their own. Um, the, the other thing was uh, as it comes to infrastructure, the word rural was always in front of broadband. Now it's not, now it says broadband. Uh, we have a rural broadband need. We have a rural water need. We have people in the live on our mountains who don't wash their clothes. Think about that. You have a four hundred thousand dollar home. The laundromats down here in the in the in town make a right at the light. They do their their wash their clothes at a laundromat. So it's not a selling point for Fayette County to have either a bad water or b no water. When you put these numbers together on both broadband and water, the numbers per unit, per house, don't equate to what happens in the city of Pittsburgh or in the city of Philadelphia. Guess who's getting the money for some of these rural water, pro or these, uh, sorry, I even said the word rural, who these water projects and these broadband projects, they're being cherry picked to the, the cities where it's easy to do this, where it doesn't cost as much per unit. Um, but I go back to our federal and our state people who are here today as well. Everybody deserves clean water. And it is not a, um, a luxury. It is a necessity. We have to have clean water in Fayette County. We have clean water in Fayette County. It's just getting it to the people. And I, I can't stress that enough. Our numbers, our cost estimates, for our projects in these areas are not going to look good in comparison to a high population area. So uh, to my federal and state friends, keep that in mind as, as you support uh, clean water and broadband in Fayette County. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, for question number three. With rising rates in overdose deaths, suicides, and other mental health related concerns, what are your plans to address this in our schools and our communities? And whoever wants to go first can go first. I'll go first. So uh, Fayette County is the recipient uh, of a settlement in opioid litigation. We received about $9 million, 9 to $10 million over an 18-year period. We are given a long list of ways that we are permitted to spend the money. We are not permitted to spend the money on any law enforcement. It's only in prevention, treatment, and education. So we have got uh, to work with our Drug and Alcohol Commission, who's here today, thank you guys, um, to put in three basic programs that we hope help stem the tide of substance use disorder in Fayette County. And I'm very proud of this because we are going directly at our targets. And I'm gonna tell you who our targets are. The first one, the inmates at the Fayette County Jail, about 95% of them have a substance use disorder problem. We know this, and we are going to put money into a program to help them. And this is gonna help being at the new jail as well, that we're gonna have space for these programs. The second target group is the homeless. And we know that the homeless uh, people we're gonna work with, uh, drug and alcohol is gonna work with City Mission and to uh, A, provide the homeless a place to stay, but B, make sure that they get into drug treatment. The third is very, this is, this is we are maybe the only one in the state, is that true, Melissa, the, to do the cast? Uh, okay, we were the first ones that started in the state. It's called a cast program. 
and if you overdosed and were brought back by Narcan, you are going to be visited by a member of Fayette EMS and the Drug and Alcohol Commission that day. We know that 12% of the people that they go out to visit go into drug rehab. Now, 12% doesn't sound like a very big number, but you have to think about who they're dealing with. They're dealing with somebody who overdosed that day. So we know they need help with, with uh, treatment. We know the people in our jail need help with treatment. We know the homeless need help with treatment. And those are the three targets that we are going directly at. We're not casting some big net over the entirety of Fayette County. We're going directly at them. And I hope that that helps solve the problem. Thank you. Well, commissioners, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Vince. Okay. Um, yeah, I agree uh, with those targets. I think they're going directly to the users, and, and I think that will have a greater impact overall than uh, you know, using them for uh, programs that you know, wouldn't be able to get directly to the people that are affected the most. Um, but we do have an overdose task force in the county, and uh, they're, they just redid their, comp, uh, their strategic plan and they're about to start implementation of that. And I think uh, we're, we're, we've gotten some opioid settlement money, as Scott said, um, and there's some other lawsuits that are out there that we're gonna garner additional funds. Um, I'd like to see us, you know, hopefully by the end of these all, all these different lawsuits as they get settled, to hope to have close to a million dollars a year to, to distribute. So we have to really strategically you know, figure out from this point, we're off to a good start with the three areas, but uh, where can we best and highest use that money in the, you know, with the other programs? We need to take a look at the uh, overdose task force to make sure that it is funded properly to carry out their mission. Um, because that is a good plan. Uh, we have a lot of uh, collaboration amongst the uh, people that are uh, tuning into the meetings every couple weeks and uh, I'd like to see that uh, funded properly for, you know, for implementation in the future, which I think will have a great impact on our, you know, on our uh, drug problem in the county. When I first became a commissioner, um, I went to several schools where the, uh, actually Fayette EMS and several people that had been addicted to drugs and, um, and then finally did get off were a part of the schools. And the one area in particular, and we all know this, you have to catch them when they're young. But the sad part about it is when there are so many of the kids in schools, and I don't know if you're aware of this, you probably are, so many of the kids in schools, especially elementary schools, um, many times they're fixing their own breakfast, they're getting themselves up, themsel they're getting themselves up to go to school. Um, some of the stories that I've heard are just heart-wrenching. And it's sad to know that we have little kids out there that are actually taking care of themselves. And I know that our uh, CYS program has truancy officers in the schools, and my firm belief is that a lot of it, and I know that, um, that our drug task force and our um, drug and alcohol is really focusing that direction also, and that's education in the schools. It's a, this is a war. This is definitely a war. And uh, the, just a little while ago, we were in, in a meeting and uh, talked about some of these areas. And there are some good things out there. I'm not going to just leave with the bad, but there are some good things out there, different programs that fit each kid. Uh, one doesn't fit the other. And uh, like a, equestrian will fit some kids that may help them get out of the drug scene, get out of that loop. And there's another one, a kickboxing program that's in Connellsville. Uh, just different areas. That, uh, that we hope to focus for. And my philosophy has always been this, if we save one, we've, we've made our task, we've done what we need to do. I wanna save them all, but if we save one, we're successful. So it's, a, it's an epidemic and, um, and it's, it's killing our kids, it's killing our society, and we will fight. We will do everything possible to help those agencies. Thank you, commissioners, for taking the time out of your busy days to support this forum. Um, let's show them our appreciation.
Okay, I, at this time I'd like to invite up to the stage um, Nate Navala from Congressman Rutherford Haller's office. Um, and he's going to take a few minutes to bring us up to date on the Congressman's agenda. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nate Navala. I am uh, Congressman Guy Reschenthaler's District Chief of Staff. Uh, pleasure to be with you today, and thank you for uh, allowing me a few minutes today to give you an update uh, on where uh, what Guy is working on in Congress. And uh, uh, also, I just want to announce that if there's any type of um, issues that you are having with our uh, or with the federal government, such as uh, tax issues with your businesses, uh, please let me know. Uh, we'll be glad to, uh, to to address some of those later on but not right now. <laughs> um, Congressman Guy Reschenthaler, he is in his third term in Congress. Uh, he is a member of the House Appropriations Committee and also a member of the House Committee on Rules. Uh, he was also selected by Speaker McCarthy to be on the China Task Force uh, in the last Congress. Um, this year, is, 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 uh, the House is now in Republican control. Uh, with that, uh, the Congressman now serves in the leadership role. Uh, he is the Chief Deputy Whip in the House uh, and is the primary assistant to the Whip, Tom Emmer, and he is the Chief Vote Counter for the party. Uh, the current, uh, our current um, uh, leadership with Speaker McCarthy's team, uh, Tom Emmer was one of the members that were picked to be the uh, House uh, Whip and he has picked Guy uh, to serve along with him. Uh, he said about Guy, no one is more, more determined than Guy, and his experience as a U.S. Navy veteran is viral to our addition as our leadership team in the House. His reputation and re relationships within the House conference speaks volumes of his abilities, and Guy will play a crucial role in the House Republicans to deliver on our commitments to what we made for the American people. And during the last election, there were some commitments made uh, by our party. A guy uh, actually invited the team of the House leadership, uh, Republican leadership, to our district to announce our commitment to America. And some of the uh, legislative items that they are getting on track with starting is to make our economy strong, uh, fighting inflation and lowering the cost of living, uh, making America energy independent and reducing gas prices, and strengthening the supply chain and ending our dependence on China. Uh, other issues we're looking at is making the nation safe by securing the border and combating illegal immigration, reducing crime and public safety by supporting 200 more police officers and opposing all efforts to defund the police. Uh, also, the nation's uh, top security by supporting our troops, investment in our military, and selecting a committee on China uh, that will exercise peace through strength uh, with our allies in, uh, on the fight against China. Uh, also, to make sure that we have a government that is more accountable, uh, to preserve our constitutional freedoms, to hold Washington more accountable, and to restore the people's voice in Congress. Uh, so these are some of the reforms and some of the votes that uh, the Congressman will be making. And if there are any questions, I'd be glad to take them back to him. Love when there's none. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, once again, if you, we could ever be of assistance to you or your business, uh, please reach out to our office. Thanks so much. Thank you, Nate. Senator Casey's office was scheduled to be here today as well, but we're unable to attend as they are working on site at the train incident in Palestine, Ohio. So we wish them luck there. Now I'd like to invite up to the stage uh, Senator Pat Stefano, Representative Ryan Warner, and Representative Charity Grim Krupa.
have short legs, so I don't know how this is going to work out. So. <laughs> okay, that's good. I don't like the chairs either. That's great. So. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> you can. Well, we are, we are, as a community, are, are very fortunate to be representative in our state government by friends who are committed to working with residents and the businesses of Fayette County. Uh, to have a kind and easy relationship with, with you and open lines of communication that exists is very rare and it's wonderful. And we appreciate your participation here with us today. Like our commissioners, we've asked each of you to spend a couple of minutes introducing yourselves and then and sharing your priorities for the year. And when you're done, we'll start with the questions. So, Senator Stefano, we'll start with you. Thank you, Greg. Good afternoon, Senator Pat Stefano. <laughs> yeah, it is participation if you want. You know. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be real brief. Uh, this is a, a new session. We just came through our last election session uh, in November. Um, I am now in my third term. And my district is different, so I wanted to highlight that. I've lost almost all of Westmoreland County, so all I have left now is Scottsdale Borough, then all of Fayette, all of Somerset County, and now including all of Bedford County. So it is, it's a rather large district. The population of Pennsylvania did grow, which means all of us have to represent more people. And as you know, uh, Pennsylvania, the southwestern Pennsylvania, lost population again, but not as quickly as we were before. So that, there is some good news underneath there. So uh, that's why I had to expand out into uh, Bedford County. So that is the new district. I want to highlight a couple things that I'm doing. Change, because it's a new session, I have a new committee that I chair, and I am chairing Consumer Protection and Professional Licensure, something I've uh, been battling for for over two years, and this committee hasn't changed hands in almost 25 years. So I'm so glad to be part of that. Some of the issues you heard today, well, I'll be talking about. Uh, this, uh, the CPPL, as I'll call it, to make it quick, uh, will be overseeing the um, PUC. So that has a lot of issues. Rail is one of them. Uh, all the electric generators, all the electric distribution companies. We're dealing with those issues, dealing with the solar and wind and generational issues. That's even before we get over to the consumer protection side. And we work with the 29 licensing boards through the Department of State. So there's a lot of work to do. I'm knee deep in meetings right now and meeting with all the stakeholders and getting to understand the committee. Uh, other committees, I am vice chair of transportation, which is key. As uh, Commissioner Vince Vecides talked about uh, finishing the Mon Valley Expressway, we are working on that constantly. And even though this is Fayette County, we're still working on finishing 219s in Somerset County into 68. That is a Northwest freight corridor. We need that finish. It benefits us as well. And uh, I'm still on appropriations committee, so any dollars that are spent through the state come through the appropriations committee, so I still sit there. And uh, I'm on consumer, or, um, yeah, community economic recreational development, because I always know the, uh, the, the, the absurd short uh, abbreviations, but I had to spell it out for you. And, uh, and I'm now on human services, aging and youth, and um, the last committee is state government. I stay, was able to stay on state government. Um, on top of that, I took on some more duties. I am now the statewide chair of the Early Childhood Education Caucus, and we are working on some issues, of course, there. We talked about education throughout the, the day today. Nothing is more key than starting with our youth. And the other committee that I'm co-chairing across the state, it's a bicameral, uh, bipartisan, is the Arts and Culture Caucus. So I'll be chairing that along with... Uh, Senator uh, Jay Costa and uh, members of the House. So, uh, on, in my spare time, <laughs> yeah. So that, that I wanted to highlight that and uh, thank you for the questions that will be coming. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, we won't. Go, we won't. We won't go out into the shadows. Uh, so I do want to start off with a very important piece of. Business Commissioner Dunn, I am in the boat for Chick Fil A. <laughs> uh, seriously, I, I do want to thank everybody for coming out here today. Uh, I want to thank the chamber for hosting this event. Uh, they do this every year. They they do a great job. So let's just quickly give a hand round for everybody that put this in today. 
And of course, Penn State Fayette for opening up their facilities. They are uh, always so accommodating to us here. I know I used to have the office across the street, and we've had a lot of events and have done a lot of things here over the years. So, so I do want to thank them. And, and as a former alumni, I believe Pat was former alumni too. We are. I don't, I don't know. How. <laughs> I don't, oh, and charity. I didn't know that too. All right. Go Penn State Fayette. Uh, I bet a few of my professors from back in the day would be a little shocked that I'm up here, but nonetheless, <laughs> here I am. So, as Pat mentioned, we are in a new legislative, uh, new legislative session. I am Representative Ryan Warner. I represent the 52nd District, which is now all Fayette, which I'm very happy about. Uh, I do miss the parts of Westmoreland I had, but it was a little bit more difficult having multiple counties. God bless you, Senator, for having three of them, because it is, it is a lot more difficult when you're being bounced around. So now I get to put all my effort into Fayette County. Uh, my committees are much the same, but because of the makeup of the House this year, I did have to lose a committee. Unfortunately, I had to lose the Transportation Committee. I'm still on Appropriations Committee. Uh, I am on the Energy Committee, and I am on the Consumer Affairs Committee. So, you know, uh, it's, it's not a surprise to any of us that, that we often talk about our top priority being jobs for Fayette County, right, in this area. Every politician that's here wants to bring in jobs. But I also think that we have to look at workforce development, which is a priority for me, right? So I, I'm sure there's a lot of people in here already that have businesses that say, hey, we got jobs. <laughs> we need people to work them, right? That's a major issue for our area. There's a lot of good paying jobs that are out there uh, through, and whether it be through, through education, uh, I'm a huge advocate of vocational education to expand that, uh, not just in Pennsylvania, but in our whole country. I think that that's, that's also something that we have to look at. Um, you know, and over, we, we mentioned, look, it's not, it's not a secret the issues that Fayette County has had over the years, right? So after the decline of coal and steel, we all know that this area went into a fairly large decline. But, you know, I'm happy to say over the last few years, I, I think that this county's heading in the right direction. I think we have a good group of people working here. Uh, the group of people that are currently here today, our commissioners, the representatives, the senators, your local elected officials, I do think we have, we have a great group of people. Uh, and it, it goes to show you, look at some of the projects we have going on. Look at Connellsville. We have, what is that, a 15 or $20 million investment from Excella Health or building a brand new facility in Connellsville, Pennsylvania. Uh, the Russick Ridge coal mine on top of the mountain. Um, there's also the Tenesca power plant. I know it's not right in our county, but it's right on the border. That's hundreds of good paying family sustaining jobs right here. You know, th there are things happening in this, in this area and I'm excited to be a part of that. I'm very, very excited to be a part of that. Um, you know, there are, there are some potential going forward here. There are talks about southwestern Pennsylvania and being a hydrogen hub. I've had many discussions about that. That's amazing for our area, the amount of jobs that would bring in. Just had a discussion with somebody yesterday that was uh, looking for grant money, that was working with Congress to, to, to build a um, liquid fuels plant here to power the jets in Pittsburgh in Fayette County. So those are things that are being discussed here that I don't think were being discussed for a very, very long time. And that takes an effort of all of us here. Not one representative, not one senator, not one commissioner. It takes this community. It takes everybody here. It takes us all banding together. And I can tell you, since I've been elected, that I'm pretty damn proud to be a part of this community. And I'm pretty proud to help push Fayette forward. I look forward to answering some questions. Thank you. So for those that don't know me, I'm Charity Grim Krupa. I am a freshman representative. Um, I am from the 51st District, which is Southern Fayette County. I started taking classes here at Fayette Campus when I was uh, 16, couldn't drive a car yet. And it was through uh, the Eberly Foundation. It was a star program. And through the classes that I was able to take here, um, and, then I, and then my parents had to, to pay for a few too, I was able to skip my senior year and go to University Park early. And I'm very proud. Um, but I have, I can one-up these guys because we're all alumni, but my daughter's now here as a freshman in the nursing program. So I've got a kid here that's at Penn State, so <laughs> not to brag. But um, so unlike these wonderful guys up here, 
they are drawing from a lot of experience. Um, I am brand new. And unfortunately, because the way the House is now with the minority majority numbers, um, we haven't been able to do a lot of business. There's been a lot of behind the scenes work and policy hearings. And Sen uh, Senator Stefano's Senator for the Day event was wonderful yesterday. I really love that. I was really impressed with the insight and the talent and the, uh, the knowledge of our high school students who participated. But I was invited to be a panelist and it, it was a wonderful experience, but I felt like a farce because it was all about being on committees and being a panel for these students acting like a committee. I just got my committee assignments. I've done nothing on, an, on a committee yet. Um, so, so that was educational for me as well and I'm looking forward to that. The committees that I was assigned to, um, I wish, you know, as freshmen they say, you know, what are the top five committees that you want? You're lucky if you get one or two. In hindsight, I wish they would have said, what are the top five that you don't want to get? Um, so, but I, uh, Daryl Becker, will, he knows how badly I wanted to be on the uh, Ag Committee, and that's a very popular committee. I wasn't able to get that. But uh, I, I am a lawyer by trade. Don't hold it against me. I'm a farm girl at heart, raised on a farm, raising my kids on a farm. But I am very proud to say that I did get on Veteran Affairs and Emergency Preparedness. Um, our veterans um, have put their life on the line for all of the freedoms that we enjoy. Um, our first responders, whether it's the police or your uh, EMS or your firefighters are putting their li lives on the line every day to protect all of us. Um, and I'm very excited to be part of that. Um, I did spend my entire legal career trying to avoid CYS cases. Um, so that was kind of ironic that I'm on that committee, Children and Youth Services. Um, but between that and the human services, which is so much of our Pennsylvania budget, I feel like that that is a wonder, wonderful opportunity to serve the community. And even though they may not have been my top picks, I am, I am excited to, to be on those committees and do what I can because I think those are, the, across the state, are huge issues and to be a voice of that and a part of that. And if you're involved locally with any organization that has anything to do with that, please reach out to my office. I'd love to meet with you and get your insight on what you think are the top priorities and what we should be looking at. In terms of constituent services, um, one thing as a, as a freshman that I did not realize is that We've got backdoor uh, access to all these different agencies at, at state level. The unemployment program, uh, that is something that should just work on its own, and unfortunately it does not, and it's kind of a disgrace. But if you know anybody that's having problems getting their unemployment um, benefits that they deserve, you know, reach out, whether you're in uh, my district or Ryan's, uh, reach out to the state representatives because they can help. Uh, rent rebate and tax rebate forms, those are just some of the things that we do in our district offices t to help you all. If you're not sure, and that's this is the beautiful thing about the resources that we have. I'll be the first to tell you, particularly as a new person, there's a lot that I don't know. The learning curve is steep, but what I don't know I can find out, and it could just be that I'm making calls to get you to the right person, whether that's Pat Stefano or, or a particular agency, um, unfortunately, there have been a handful of times that I think you need a lawyer, um, but I try to come up with a creative way uh, to, to help people. Even if it's something that may not be within my specific realm, I, I encourage my staff to think outside of the box and, and, and if we can provide suggestions, if there's nothing specific that we can do. Um, but you get me talking and I won't shut up, so um, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. I've got an open door policy, so if there's something that my office can help you with, please give me a call. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, we're going to move on to the questions. Again, as I mentioned before, we had a survey and a lot of questions came back. And we'll start with this one. As Fayette County has a tourism-based economy, we welcome hundreds of thousands of visitors every year who stay in our hotels, motels, campgrounds, and B&Bs. Additionally, we are now seeing hundreds of new locations for Airbnb and Verbo. Unlike the rest of the lodging sites, these are largely unregulated with few reporting requirements. Can you tell us if you have plans to work to make this industry more transparent? And whoever wants to go first can go first. Yeah, sure, I'll go first. Yeah, it, uh, so this is an issue that has been, that has been brought up to me. Um, and I, I know that there was, there was some recent effort within the county to, to get a list of the Airbnbs. Uh, I mean, I can tell you, it depends on, on how you want to look at the issue. Uh, there's, there's two different ways that you could take a look at this. Uh, you could say, hey, Airbnbs, this isn't fair uh, because, you know, other people are paying county taxes, right? And you're just kind of, 
you're, you're excluding the hotel tax because you're just doing your thing off on your own. Uh, and there's also some people that are going to make the argument of, hey, this is just somebody's house, and if they want to put it up and let somebody stay there, and uh, why have the government get involved? Uh, I, I'm sure that the I'm sure that the commissioners and here everyone locally would probably like to to capture some of that money. So uh, I have my ears open. Um, you know, if there's anything else, if there's any legislation or anything in Harrisburg that that we need to do or we can do, uh, I'd be happy to happy to listen to it. As Charity has mentioned, we're a little bit behind the eight ball uh, compared to the Senate since uh, last week was the like official first week that we were able to to actually introduce any legislation. So, so as um, as a new person, one of my highest priorities is to be educated 360 degrees around an issue before uh, making a decision, particularly with respect to legislation. Um, I, do, I do like the idea. I recognize that geographically this area is beautiful. We have a rich um, historic um, significance and in story. My undergraduate degree was history. Um, and I think that, that we would be, um, we wouldn't be serving our area if we weren't trying to push that tourism um, and, and not, not only for the monetary benefits, um, but so even locally, um, you know, people can appreciate the wonderful things that this area has to offer. Um, from uh, the, the back end of this, I guess, um, it's, it's almost like, I would think that, that these particular um, homeowners who are using this, I would think that they would want their presence known. Um, so the, the more people that know about it, um, the more that it's utilized. And, and unfortunately, that comes with the price tag. I mean, and, and I don't necessarily believe that they need to be taxed the same way that a hotel in downtown Uniontown or, or um, in downtown Pittsburgh should be taxed. But it is a unique um, land use, and I think that it only makes sense to have a unique tax structure that would consider all of the income and all of the expenses and, and be fair and appropriate to that industry and what they're using that for. Um, so again, if that's something that any of you have strong opinions on one way or the other, um, I'd, I'd like to make an informed decision if that comes up for some type of a vote on the floor. All right, thank you. I'm going to be a little more exact on it. Uh, I worked on this issue on a different side, on the hotel side. When we talked about the Expedias, there was an issue, oh, it was about three or four years ago, where they were paying a different tax rate when they would book a hotel compared to the hotel's tax rate. And that is an unlevel playing field. And what we're seeing is the same thing happening now with the Airbnbs. I think it's a great idea. Everybody, there's plenty of space for everyone to compete. But the way the hotel tax is set up is designed to help the community draw in more. And that's, that's the way this works. It doesn't, it's not a tax on the local community. It's those who come and stay and visit with us. And this playing field needs to be leveled as well. So those that are participating, and I think it's wonderful if you have a, bought an extra house, you fixed it up, and you want to rent it out, it's helpful for the EMS services to know who's there. It's helpful for the municipalities to know who's there, and it's also helpful for the tourism agencies so they can benefit and make sure that they're advertising the area. So we're going to be working on legislation that will be very similar to what we did in the past. How that's going to look, that will be hammered out as all legislation is hammered out. There'll be hearings to be had, bouncing back and forth between the House, House and the Senate. But it's something I'm interested in because I think, again, as we all compete, we want to compete on a level playing field, and that's all I'm asking for. Thank you. All right, question number two. Um, you know, the uh, state Supreme Court recently ruled that the funding of uh, public education is unconstitutional in Pennsylvania. And um, so are there any specific initiations, initiatives in the works for the state to fund public school system and make it more equitable and, and, and sustainable? And would you be willing to meet with educators from across the county to uh, vent their concerns with the current public education system? Who would like to go first? Let's start. I've had these conversations already, and I do meet with my uh, educators as much as I possibly can. This is a big issue. It's something I've, we've talked about since I came into office eight years ago. But this is Pennsylvania, and this is how we, we just do things because that's the way we do things. 
and change is very difficult. Yes, we've known the formula was wrong. The formula never really worked well in the beginning. So they did the level up formula, uh, what, four, four, six years ago? It was any new money going into education was on a different formula. And we always get these reports when money is going in, every budget into the um, education system, how our local uh, school districts are going to fare. We see that, we can see the numbers. Are they right? No. Are they wrong? No. They just are. And change is going to be very difficult. Now, courts said they're unconstitutional. I don't know how that's going to play out. They didn't give a remedy. They said the remedy belongs with the, uh, the legislature, which is exactly true. So how do we hammer this out? This is a $15 billion question. How do you make this work equitably? And your guess is as good as mine, how we're going to redraft it. Are we going to redraft it? Yes. When are we going to redraft it? Probably not after we have beat it up a long time. So look for something to be happening in the next several months. Look for uh, dollar figures to be pumped into the current two formulas that we have coming into the budget in June. But don't look for anything to change before June. It's just not enough time to, to work it out. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, so just to jump off of what you know, Pat said, look, the system was always broken, and this needed to happen, right? You can't have one school district that has an NFL-style NFL brand-new AstroTurf football field, and then another school can't afford basic supplies for kids. It's public education. Like, there can't be that big of a difference in public education. Is every school going to be exactly the same? No, it's, it's not going to be exactly the same. But you can't have that big of a disparity in public education. And this is not going to be an easy task, as, as the senator said. I don't have all the answers. All I know is that I could not support the current system the way that it was because of that. You know, we have our school districts, you know, I know there are struggles here, and there are some things that we can, that we can look at, whether it be charter, charter school reform. Um, I'd like to see maybe our, our schools, if they offer their own cyber charter, that you'd have to go to that option first before, if you got reimbursed. And that's getting into the weeds a little bit, but there are some things that, that we can do to help out our school districts, but it, 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 we need a funding overhaul. And my personal take on it, I mean, we want to get into the property tax discussion or not, because it's going to happen with that, right, is, is the way that we actually collect the money for the school districts, you know, is that fair? Uh, on top of, you know, Senator mentioned about the, the, edu the, the basic education funding formula that we have now um, and, you know, the fair funding formula, which is part of the issue. Uh, there, there's a lot into it. But to, to, to go back to that, if we, we want to look at the property taxes and how we fund, I'll give you my own personal take on public education, now, this is public education, that each school in this district should get the same amount of money based on where you are, and you can do maybe some, some variances for the, for the location, but each student should, have the, same, should be, have the same amount of money invested to them, whether you live in the inner city of Pittsburgh, whether you live in rural parts of Clearfield County or Fayette County, or in the inner city of Philadelphia. You should have an equal chance at education in this state. And it's going to be our defining issue this session. I don't have all the answers here. I could tell you what I'd like to see. I have, you know, Ryan Warner's plan in my head on how we should tax and reform property taxes. Uh, but ultimately, uh, that won't be the product we have. It'll take a lot of compromise and a lot of effort for us to all work together, Democrat and Republican, to solve this issue. Thank you. So I was on Albert Gallatin's school board for three years, and one of the hardest uh, meetings, a series of meetings that I went through were meetings where they were cutting certain uh, music classes and music programs. And um, the kids were there, and they rallied, and it was, um, they kind of lost that, that battle that they were fighting on that day. And, and I supported them in their efforts and voted in support of, of those things. But it, it's heartbreaking to see programs like that that for funding reasons, or, or at least based, uh, that's the, the reason that's articulated, for funding reasons that they're gonna be cut. And, uh, and that, that shouldn't happen. Um, I would support efforts where um, it needs to be based on a per student, and it doesn't make any sense to me that um, everything else being considered equal, that a, that a student in Uniontown 
doesn't get as much money as a student from Philadelphia. And, and historically, there have been proposals um, that there would be a lot more money given to, to some of the inner city school districts. Um, and that just does not make any sense to me, though. But, but one reason for a difference is if a child has an IEP. Um, and I, I believe um, it was at least a fourth up to a, a third of the students in Albert Gallatin have an IEP. And, and obviously then that would justify a change. And that needs to be you know, calculated into those funding um, issues. But this is an opportunity that, that we don't have to take, you know, in a blessing in disguise, God works in mysterious ways. The fact that this case, and my understanding is it's a 400 page opinion. And I'll be honest, I've not read the 400 page opinion. I'm relying on our caucus attorneys uh, to summarize that. But I, but I will, I plan on reading that, but it's, we don't have to take our current structure and revamp it. We can start at the ground and, and start new. And there needs to be serious consideration given for the mental health issues that all of our schools, whether that is, whether that is a result of COVID and the epidemic. But um, when I did um, a Zoom meeting with some of the local superintendents, and that was such a big issue that they all talked about, um, that, that that is interfering with their day-to-day -day function in the school and education, and it needs to be addressed. So I was um, very pleased when, um, Governor Shapiro gave his budget address that there was a, a new block item specifically for mental health programs in the public school setting. Um, so, but um, again, as a freshman, and I don't mean to keep meaning to, to pull that card, um, but I don't have quite the experience that these guys have to, but, but they're always, their doors are always open and I can ask them questions. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, this next question is uh, directed to Representative Warner. Last session, you had legislation signed into law that required the Pennsylvania Turnpike to notify customers about VTOLs and helps the Turnpike address the issue of people not paying the bills. Can you share a bit more about this legislation and what it does? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, anyone that watched Channel 11 may be familiar with this issue because they really, they really ran with this, this story. Uh, basically, I guess it should describe what a, what a VTOL is. And, uh, that's kind of how this legislation came to be. Uh, people were getting charged on their turnpike easy passes, this mysterious VTOL, and a lot of people didn't seem to know what a VTOL was or how they got it, and a lot of people didn't even know that they were getting these VTOLs. I see Nate down there shaking. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, and you know, I wasn't either. I, this was an issue that was brought forward to me. And uh, there was a lot of investigative work done from Angie Moreski at, at WPXI. And I worked alongside her to, to try to get some information and get to the bottom of this issue. And after some talks with the Turnpike and a lot of meetings, uh, I, I got to figure out what this was. And basically was on your transponder for a Turnpike. If you went through an entry plaza and it registered, and you went through an exit plaza and it didn't register, you were getting charged a $10, what they were calling a video toll. Uh, and it could work vice versa. It's if the transponder worked on one of the ways and didn't work on the other. Now that could be because you had a bad transponder. It could be because maybe you had some junk on top of your transponder and it wasn't working right, or you had it in your middle console and you hurried up and tried to get it up real quick before you got through. But uh, nonetheless, it became an issue because people were doing short trips to work, maybe that were only a dollar eighty-five uh, per you know per entry exit, and they're getting charged ten dollars, and, and they weren't even being notified, and then they were getting hit with these fees, and then there was an issue with people trying to go back. And, and pay these fees after the fact with the, the, the turnpike. And so basically what the legislation did was have the turnpike notify customers what a VTOL is. So if you, got, if you get hit with a VTOL today in Pennsylvania, you're gonna know about it because my legislation requires the turnpike to send you a letter to tell you, you got charged with a VTOL, uh, you need to check the date on your transponder or check how you have it mounted properly. It's $10, but if you give us a call, we'll get rid of it for you. Uh, that's basically what the legislation does. Now, it works with the Turnpike. The Turnpike were having some issues and they were like, Representative Warner, do you think you could help us out while you're pushing a piece of Turnpike legislation? And I said, yeah, I know one of their big issues and I know the Senate had hearings on it. It still is an issue, this does not fix it, but it should help. Uh, they had a lot of people that were being charged tolls and just simply not paying them. 
uh, people that were just going through and, and the recourse for the turnpike wasn't that strong. So my legislation added in further recourse uh, for the turnpike to go after people that were deliberately not paying tolls or deliberately going through toll boats, like with James Bond license plates type of stuff, trying to evade the toll. So it kind of helped out the turnpike too to try to collect some of these tolls and help consumers by giving them a heads up that they were getting charged a fee from the government and to know about it. Thank you. Anyone wish to add any? Ed, okay. I can real quick, I'll ask a simple question. Okay. How do you get, it cost me $20 to go to Harrisburg. So how do I get a VTOL so I don't have to only pay 10? <laughs> that's part of the part, that's part of the legend. I got charged with a VTOL and I actually brought that up to the turnpike. I was like, so if I just hide my transponder on one of my trips, I'm gonna get charged, and it was. It was an issue for the turnpike too, so. I'm sure that addressed that issue. Only you would come up with that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. Um, what are the steps you are taking to make Fayette County more attractive to businesses? And who would like to go first? Well, that's a very broad-based question. Very broad. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, things that I'm working on, uh, I'll, I'll bring that up, but one of the things I, reasons that I decided to step away from my business to do this was try to get government out of the way. That seems to be the problem all the time. They're, they were interfering, so when they asked me to run for Senate, and I said, First, I said, no way, I'm not doing that. But then more I thought about it, I needed to do the job myself because no one else was listening to me. So the, my goal is to make sure we're streamlining business as much, or government as much as possible to get out of business's way. Number two issue that I'm working on is infrastructure. You heard that all throughout the day. We cannot develop, and we are prime for development if we don't have the infrastructure in place. Number one, we have to build new infrastructure. Number two, we have aging infrastructure. Those are two bad combinations. So those are things that we really need to work on. And those committees that I chair now is what is key for me to work in that field. So I'll just be real brief, but I think that is the way. Lastly though, and Faye Penn knows this because they're working on it as well. We can build all this, bring all these companies in, but if we don't have housing for the workers that we're gonna have, uh, we're, we're, we're in a bad place. So housing is one of the third biggest components that we'll be, be addressing. Repeat the question. Yeah, yeah, what, are, you, are, are you doing any, taking any steps to make Fayette County more attractive to businesses? Anything in your, that you're working on that would yeah. be attractive to us? So, I think we need to address one that we accomplished last session, not just for Fayette County, but for the state of Pennsylvania was that we were able to success, successfully cut the corporate net tax rate in the state of Pennsylvania. We had one of the highest, we had the highest tax rate, stagnant tax rate, in the United States of America, which is unacceptable to bring businesses in here, right? And I know when sometimes you hear the word corporate tax rate, there might be a stigma with that, right? Well, I can assure you, coming from a family with a small S-Corp, there's a lot of small businesses that are corporations, right? So this helped out tremendously, uh, and we have to continue pushing that, right? There's a whole lot of things in Pennsylvania as a whole that we can affect, it, not just right here locally, that, that we can do. Because things like that affect us more so than a lot of other parts of the state, right? Not that, you know, we have a... You know, you have a global and international economy here. When people are looking at a, at a state, these are factors that you look at. But a double whammy for us was that we are right on the border of three other states. Three other states that all have lower business tax rates than Pennsylvania. So how do you attract a business that's looking to, to come to this area and Ohio, West Virginia, and Maryland all get to say, hey, you can come here cheaper, right? And one of the other things that we have to, that we need to address, and I'm happy to hear Governor Shapiro make a big point about this in his initial address, was cutting regulations, right? Specifically, we have DEP regulations that are historically some of the law. <laughs> Commissioner Lohr is happy about that. Uh, uh, per, yes, permitting delays. Uh, Pennsylvania has been notoriously one of the worst states in this union. For, for permitting purposes. For, and 
those are just two things right off of the bat, you know, that we can do that, that can improve this area, right? And again, just to, to, to piggyback off of what I mentioned earlier, to make Fayette County better isn't going to be one of us with a good idea, right? It takes all of us. It takes representatives. It takes senators. It takes mayors and borough councilmen and commissioners. It takes a chamber of commerce. It takes the Connellsville Chamber of Commerce. It takes everybody together because when places want to invest into an area, that's what they look for. How do these people work together? What are they doing? Will they be able to help us out? If there's an issue with water, are the commissioners going to fight or are they going to get together and make sure that we have water, right? These are the things that businesses across this country look for. This is what they get input for. And whether it be grants, and we all know that we have to work from the bottom up to get grants, uh, these are the things that can continue to push our area forward. And like I said, I think right now we have a heck of a team. And I honestly believe, in the bottom of my heart, that Fayette County's brightest days are ahead of us. So in all the um, policy hearings that I've attended, regardless, and some have been about education, some have been about energy um, and various things, a common theme is the lack of a, of a workforce right now, that, they're, that they're, we're just not filling all the jobs that's available. Um, and part of that um, is a lack of skilled labor, that it doesn't, the, the, the workers that we do have don't match the particular industry. Um, but the, um, so I think that supporting our CTIs um, in, a, or in, in a particular trade schools, that's huge. And, and I was talking to, um, I forget, I'm not sure of her title, but from LBI, I'm not sure if she's still here, but there's a quote that's my, one of my favorite quotes, Einstein, and I'll try not to butcher it, but it's that everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by his ability to climb a tree, he'll go his whole life thinking he's a fool. And, and it took me having my own children to realize um, and appreciate, I guess is the word, um, I also have three brothers that were like night and day, but it took me having my own ch children to realize that everybody, God gave us each our own set of skills and abilities and talents, and each child learns in a different way. So we have to have the resources and tools um, and, and basically curriculum available for these young people or or the adult workforce. I know that uh, PIC does, a, the Private Industry Council really tries to get some of our adults in these education programs. Um, but so workforce and building that workforce is, is one thing. The permitting issue is huge, and, and we've heard that across the industries as well. Um, and, and I think it may have been one of the commissioners that had told me that um, that it was announced, I think, on the same day that there was going to be a, a Menards in Morgantown and a Menards here in Uniontown. Well, guess what? That Menards, how long has that been Menards been there now in West Virginia? And, and have we even broke earth yet here in Fake County? Um, and that's just an example of how the permitting process is failing the people, um, not just in Fayette County, but across Pennsylvania. So what it does is it, uh, when people or companies are, are comparing Pennsylvania to other states and they take that into consideration, then they opt to go other places. Um, and, and Governor Shapiro, I do like the idea that he has noticed it, but um, so there's this idea or this, this thing that he's implemented that if your permit isn't uh, approved or decided within a particular time period that you're going to get your, your per permit application feedback. People don't want their, their money back. They want their permits. You know, so it, it, on the surface, it's, it's a knee-jerk reaction, but it really isn't fixing that underlining um, result. So, so we've got we've to deal with that permitting process. We've got to deal with workforce development. Um, and, and also, um, if I could circle back to the workforce issue, I met earlier in the week with an organization that represented nurses. And uh, everybody knows right now that, they, that the nurses have left that industry, you know, by leaps and bounds. And one of the bills that they were proposing um, was to have specific ratios based on, you know, obviously it would be different something if you were in ICU compared to a nursing home compared to um, a pediatrics unit. Um, but it was basically that that nurses higher levels of patients are being forced on them to the point, that, to almost to the point of malpractice, that there's no possible way that they can handle these numbers. By introducing and supporting legislation that makes their job more doable, you're going to get a higher rate of job satisfaction. You're going to bring more people back into that industry. Um, and then maybe, and that's just one example of thinking outside of the box. But if we think outside of the box and all these other industries that brings people into the various different industries, then that's a good way to build our build our workforce. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, on behalf of the Fayette Chamber of Commerce, I want to thank uh, Senator Stefano and Representative Warner and Representative Grim Cooper for taking the time to come here today and uh, let's show them our appreciation. I'm going to invite uh, Muriel up to the stage for the closing remarks, but before I go, I just want to say a thank you to every chamber member who responded to the survey and provided us with questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Um, hate those chairs. Rick, mental note, let's get rid of those chairs for next year. Um, I want to say thank you as well. I want to say thank you to, to all of our uh, reps that came out today, um, to Nate. Uh, I want to thank Robbie from Casey's office who called me earlier. Um, all of our county commissioners. I think, Ryan, what you said today, what you all said in different ways, but you said most pointedly, is we have a heck of a team right now from our, our towns through to the county, to the state, and to our federal government. And I, I also agree, um, we have very, very bright days in our future. I just want to thank you again for coming. Thank all of you. And uh, we'll see you at the next event. Thank you.